Good morning to those of you out there on the West Coast. Good afternoon to those of you here on the East Coast. It's a nice sunny day. Uh, I've been working hard, so I don't know if it's sunny and nice or whether it's sunny and freezing, but I'll take sunny and nice right out there. Um, I'm excited to get started on today's training. Let me just turn some of these things off where we're going to be talking about how to be a preferred vendor in federal buyer eyes. And so this idea of them seeing you as that uh, subject matter expert, et cetera. So, all right, let me get rock and rolling. I'm going to share my screen. I got all sorts of stuff to uh, go through. Okay. Uh, by the way, if you haven't visited our website, go check out our website, gupconchamber.com. All sorts of free resources out there. I'll come back to that in a minute, but that was just a placeholder. Today, we're going to be talking about, in today's training, being a preferred vendor in the federal market. In, uh, in particular, I was talking about it from an IT angle, right? My examples today might be around IT one way or another, information technology, but you can switch in your um, competency in there. So, when you think about how to be a preferred vendor and why, right? You're one of a thousand companies out there that sell what you sell to the federal market. In fact, if you're in certain areas, you're like one of 10,000 or tens of thousands. In the federal market, if you go into SAM as an example, uh, SAM is where those of us who want to sell to the federal market, we register. There's over 300,000 small businesses in SAM. And every year, 30,000 small businesses are coming in at every given point or every given year. And so that's a lot of activity, right? And that number goes, mostly it goes up. Sometimes it might go down a little bit, but sometimes it can go as high as 50,000 businesses coming in. And so you want to be able to stand out. If, if there's all these businesses in SAM and then dynamic small business search, which is the way we search that tool. Um, if there's all these businesses in there, how can you stand out? How, you know, how do you make sure that the, the buyer can find you when they're looking for companies like you? Um, when they can find you, it's like getting a VIP access to a party everybody's going to be invited to the party, right? It's a party that everybody's invited to. Uh, we're going to throw the opportunity of the RFI into SAM, et cetera. But if you can stand out when they're doing market research or when they're before, earlier in the process on market research and they're just noodling an idea around and they're doing their own research on the internet or on DSBS or wherever, if you can stand out, that's like getting a ticket to a VIP party at the party, you know, the VIP section at the party, right? And that's what you want to be. Everybody's going to be able to be there and you know, say, hey, I was at the Met Gala or whatever it is, but there's some of us who got into the room and it was a VIP experience. Some of us got into the VIP room and met VIPs where we had conversations. That's what it's like when you're a preferred vendor and that's where you want to be. It's not going to happen instantly. You don't go from not being a preferred vendor to being. And by the way, preferred vendor is an informal term I'm saying. You, you want to be seen as the, hey, I want to go talk to those people. That's all that's, that's required to become a preferred vendor. But you want to be able to reach that. And when you hit that stage and when you take the time to make this happen for you, you're going to start getting VIP tickets to parties that you want to go to, to the opportunities you want to win. Today, I'm going to be driving down into what do I just mean about um, preferred vendor? What, you know, what are the details around that? What does that look like? So I just want to kind of level set th that description. And then I'm going to go in and talk about um, some steps you can be seen or steps you can take to be seen as the subject matter expert. And after that, I want to talk about steps you can take to be more visible. So there's one that's about how do you how do you shore up or strengthen your visibility as a subject matter expert? And the other is how do you actually just be seen where they're looking? And so those are the last two uh, sections we're going to cover down on today. If you don't know who I am, my name is Neil McDonald. I want to welcome you to the uh, to my federal sales training where I provide tips for success in the federal market. I spent 20 years in the federal market as a small business owner. And since 2018, I've been teaching people like you that government contracting is not a secret. It's a process. When we follow a process A to Z, we're going to have repeatable, predictable results. That's what you want. It's what you want when you're you know, trying to make phone calls to get in the door to talk to agencies. And that's what you want at the other end of the spectrum or the life cycle where you want predictable, repeatable revenue. Um, and that's what we teach in these trainings. One thing I just wanted to point out is we are in no way affiliated with the government. We're self-funded. Um, we are uh, supported through our sustaining members. And I wanted to say thank you to the sustaining members. These are people who get value out of our training and they say, hey, you know what? Let's let, let us donate. Uh, you know, it's two hundred ninety seven dollars, by the way, to become a sustaining member. So it's like less than a dollar a day. But these members are supporting our ability to train people from Guam to the U.S. Virgin Islands and everywhere in between. So on behalf of everybody who's getting benefit, thank you very much to our sustaining members. For all of you, I want the buyers to remember who you are. I want to remember who you are. I want people who are in the community and who watch this later to know who you are. Put your company name into the chat. You can never do this in, uh, too many times. 
So if you've come to 100 or 200 or 300 of my trainings in the last couple of years here, it doesn't matter. Put it in again. We get new people all the time. Um, let them know who you are. Never get tired of it. I don't get tired of coming and training you, right? So don't you get tired of telling me who you are and what your core competency is because eventually it sinks into my mind. Eventually it sinks into the rest of the people's minds who are here. It's like, oh, Johnny, cybersecurity, Janie, you know, workforce development, et cetera. Um, and then also remember to engage in the community. One of the biggest values that we think we bring by doing these daily trainings is giving you a place where you can network, network with each other and begin to find people who perhaps you can go after opportunities together, pursue agencies together, or just have coffee together and commiserate on the fun life of government contracting. Okay, so let's talk about what do I mean when I say a preferred vendor, really? And, and in this case, I just mean preferred meaning, oh, I choose you. Like I, I start getting used to going to you because you're the one I wanna go to. And, and another way of saying that is you're rising above your competition. If there's a thousand vendors out there, how do you become the one that the federal buyer begins to look to early on in the cycle when they have an idea and they're like, you know what, we, we wanna, um, either we have this new idea and we wanna roll out something or we've got a comp an opportunity and we, a, a, a body of work we've been doing for years and we're gonna recompete it and we wanna start looking at it differently. Could we do this better? Um, are there ways to have cost savings or improve the experience for the user? All those kind of things. Well, they're gonna have these ideas. Um, the government is gonna have all these ideas about what they might want on a requirement early on in the sales cycle or in their, their case, the acquisition life cycle. And you want to rise above your competition because they're only going to talk to, let's say, five or 10 companies at most, maybe 20. You want to be in that pool of preferred vendors that they go to. And the way you get into that pool is you be findable. That's the first thing. If you sell something and you're the best at it, but the government buyer can't find you, then it doesn't matter how good you are. The government does not buy from the best small business or vendor out there. The government buys from the best they can find. Same thing with a proposal. The government does not award contracts to the best vendor out there, the best government contractor. The government awards a contract to the best of the ones that show up. Um, so findable, when you think about being findable, this means when the government is trying to find somebody to talk to about their requirement, a subject matter expert like you or your company, when they're looking to find you, it needs to be easy for them. They need to literally be able to type in something into search and it comes up, you know, whether they search in Google or they search in LinkedIn or they search in um, the dynamic small business search tool, which I'll talk about later. When they search for you, you need to be findable. So you need to make sure you're putting language in there that, that helps them do that. And I'll talk more about that in a second. The second thing that goes with um, increasing your visibility here, you got findability and attractiveness. You want to make sure you, your company, you're attractive to the buyer when they're looking for you. What I mean by attractive is that you match the search intent. If the government is searching for a plumber and they come to your profile, they don't want to see that you do all this other construction work, road crews and, and tree chopping and all these things. Oh, by the way, plumbing. That does That is not an attractive company. An attractive company is one that does um, plumbing through and through. We do pipe fitting, maybe do uh, whatever they call plumbing in a street, right? <laughs> when you're in drain pipes, like you can expand that, but it's all basically we deal with the water, uh, wastewater, storm water type things. That's all kind of related, right? That's attractive. And you can do that in whatever your core competency is. If you put in the two or three words into the chat, like I asked you about what do you sell? And I go look at your LinkedIn profile, or I go look at your website, or I go look at your capability statement, or I go look at your DSBS profile, all of it should kind of align to those two or three words because those two or three words that you put into the chat, those are the top two or three words that you want to be found by. Hopefully that's what you put in, right? So if you're a zero trust architecture firm, you put in, hey, we're zero trust. You know, we're ABC company, zero trust architecture. We're zero trust, um, you know, you put in ABC company and we're elevator maintenance and, and repair. You know, putting that stuff in is really important. And, and so when you do that, you make yourself, your company findable. When you're findable, you begin to increase that visibility for you being seen as the subject matter expert, right? When the government is looking for somebody long before they drop an RFP, they're looking for experts who can talk to them about their requirements. So they're looking for experts who can teach them about something, right? Teach them about uh, whatever the direction is they're trying to go. And so you want to be that subject matter expert. And you can also think of it as a thought leader, right? We, we, Thought leader is um, sometimes debated about what the term is, but it doesn't really matter. A thought leader means if I 
if I need to bounce something off of somebody, I can go to this person. And go, oh, they're a thought leader in this space. Um, so I, I know that uh, Nina, she might be in our um, community today and her company. One of the things that they have a really strong strength on is deaf communication access. So I can turn over and, and talk about what's the future of deaf communication access? How are we improving it as AI is coming in and social media? I can look to that company and that person and say, you're a thought leader in this space. And a thought leader basically is just another way of saying you're a subject matter expert who's good at sharing your information in a way that I can understand. Right. It's not enough for you to be a subject matter expert, but none of us can really understand or track what you're saying. You need to be able to um, communicate it in a way that we can follow it. And so federal buyers, they're not as advanced as you. That's why government contracts. They're looking sometimes just to augment the resources, right, the people. But mostly they're looking for expertise that government or the industry can bring to, to um, government. So you want to be sought after as a subject matter expert, as a thought leader. You want people to be asking you, what's your opinion? And so how do you get seen in a way that people start going, oh, hey, I want to ask these people their opinion. So in no particular order, I'm going to give you about 10 tips for being seen as a subject matter expert. And first and foremost, you must be an expert at something, right? So you, you must know your core competency and then double down on this. This is why I tell people, focus your niche, right? All, all a niche means uh, is to be good at something. An example is I had a, a customer, a person who's in our community, a company who's in our community, and they did a lot of different construction things. And we helped them narrow down into elevator space. And they really started becoming this elevator expert. They already were, but they, they doubled down on that. So they started getting seen as that more. And so it's really important for you to go, well, what are we the best at? What do we want to be the best at? Either one of those answers are, are good. And then you dive into that and say, well, let's double down on that. We want to make sure we really understand what does it mean when we say we're IT expert? Are we really IT? Uh, I had a company, for example, that said they did network engineering and cybersecurity and something else. And they said professional services. We had this conversation around professional services. And when they really began to look at it, that, that term was a little too vague because everybody has their own interpretation. But when they aligned those professional services to the network enterprise network engineering, they began to really go, that's exactly what we do. And it's like, well, if it became that clear to you, then it's going to become that clear to everybody else. And so taking the time to know your core competency and how to communicate it will increase your likelihood of being seen as the subject matter expert. And then the second thing that I have here, and I guess I could have numbered them, but the second one is know who you want to reach. And the reason I say this is if you're trying to be seen as a subject matter expert, and by the way, this is separate from the typical outreach that I teach. Here I'm talking about know who you want to reach, who you want to um, see you as a subject matter expert. So contract officers, small business professionals, they're never going to need to look at you as a SME. It's the program office. So who within the program office, what type of people are the ones that you want to reach? When you know who that is, you start really communicating to them with anything you do, which is my third bullet. Right. Start social selling. Um, social selling is this idea of what I do. Right. I'm on here. I'm talking to you. I'm engaging with you. I, I uh, put out a post recently about um, the large prime contractor, small business liaison officer. So, uh, you know, a couple hundred names of points of contact at these places. And I got a lot of engagement. I reached exactly who I was really trying to reach. I'm trying to help you with that information. But I was trying to reach these large primes to say, make sure our data is updated so I can share it with small business industry. And I got lots of them reaching out. Some are like, hey, take this one off, take that one off. Somebody this morning, this person retired. It was re They were replaced by this person. You have my email wrong. It actually is this. It's like, perfect. Thank you. Right. And so when you know who you want to reach and when you start doing social selling and you're engaging out there on LinkedIn in particular, YouTube and podcasts, those are other good ways. Those are the main ways um, you want to be reaching out there. Um, in particular, as a subject matter expert, not as a company necessarily yet, but as a subject matter expert, YouTube and, and podcasts are just as helpful as LinkedIn. Usually I'm just all in on LinkedIn, but, you know, podcasts and YouTube, uh, a YouTube channel, people can listen to that when they're running, when they're folding the laundry, when they're driving the commutes. And especially in the D.C. area, basically where I'm at, um, we have hour, two hour commutes every single day. They can listen to a lot. And so if they're able to find you and your company is attractive enough to the for them to start listening, then the information you begin to share um, can be shared in a way they can, can consume at, at, at an easy, convenient time, like driving home. Um, so number four here, bullet four is borrow, uh, maximize your borrowed credibility. 
An example of this is um, just if you're an AWS or cloud service provider, but an AWS partner, right? You can reach out and see stuff they've written and then reshare it and reshare it with your thoughts to your network. Um, this is what it means out there. Going with that, maximize the uh, borrowed credibility. If I jump down to the third one from the bottom, it says interpret government documents. This is another borrowed credibility way. But here's an example of interpreting government documents. You, you want to interpret them for your intended audience so, so that one, you can share that information and you're being seen as the expert, not only around your area of expertise, but now around the government policies or whatever that are coming out. So an example that I, I wanted to talk about was um, the White House, the um, executive office just put out a an executive order on artificial intelligence, right? You can go read it, but they just put it out on, I think Monday morning or Monday. And um, what I'm recommending, a company that does AI or, or in that kind of space does, is you take that and you share that with your target customers and put your own spin on it. First off, it's really long and it's boring. It's hard to read. Not many people are going to read it, but it's really important that agencies and, and program offices hear about this and begin to think about how we can execute on it. Well, you can take a document like that, put it down into, hey, here's the top five bullets, not, not rewriting paragraphs. Here's the top five things um, you need to pay attention to and one action step that you could take, right? If you're an expert at something that is just being coming out as a policy, you should be able to say something about it, right? And that's a, another idea of borrowed credibility. You're borrowing the credibility of the White House in this case, or of Amazon or Microsoft, uh, folks like that. So right in the middle, I've got understand the value of your LinkedIn profile, because if you want to be seen as a subject matter expert and, um, uh, and you're out there on LinkedIn, people are going to come to your LinkedIn profile and they're going to be like, begin to look at you. So you want to maximize the value. And two key areas that you could maximize value is um, one, just at the top, when you start scrolling down, if you've set your profile up this correctly, you have a featured section. And this is where you can start dropping uh, blogs you've written. We just call it an article. You could put in a little YouTube video that you had. You can put in some really key stuff. So if somebody is finding you for your expertise, when they come to your featured section, they can see many, but the first three things they see are things that reinforce expertise. You know, uh, let's say you do zero trust architecture. You could say um, zero trust architecture done right in three minutes, kind of thing or something, right? And you have that right there. If you're an expert in the field, then going to a whiteboard and creating content that you could put there that's valuable to other people should be a pretty straightforward process for you. Um, Another one is uh, down here, don't sell, provide value is what I'm saying. So if you want to be seen as a subject matter expert, make sure the stuff you share is information that can help the intended targets, right? Um, don't be selling uh, really transparently, right? I, I have customers and I always at most at the end of training go, if you'd like to work with me, go check out how. Like that's a, the entire thing. Sometimes I don't even bother saying that. The entirety of what I share is hands down content that can help you. And so it's important you do something similar. Don't be trying to sell the government into you know, uh, uh, things too fast, right? Instead, try to help them, try to help them. First, you're helping them be aware of you. Then you're helping them think about the requirements. Then they're getting to the stage where they're inviting you in to come talk to them. Um, and then the bottom here, the bottom two bullets, I really want you to understand, if you're gonna try to sit there and communicate or be um, project yourself as a subject matter expert, and when I say yourself, it can be your company or you, you're projecting on behalf of your company, right? There's two main things you want to keep in mind with that whole idea of providing value. Explain the why of something. Why is this executive order about artificial intelligence important? Why should you care? How can you do something about it afterwards, right? So you explain the why, then you teach the how. You give specific tips on what somebody can do. Um, there's all sorts of us out there who have this information that you have. It's who's going to provide the tips for moving forward. I see people keep their information and their tips so close hold. I'm like, come on. If you share that out and you want business, you're going to get more business that way because people will become aware of you. They'll see you as a trusted advisor, a subject matter expert. They'll invite you in to market research to say, hey, can you explain more about what you're talking about in this direction? Sure. Right. And it gives you a chance to talk about their needs, et cetera. So explain the why and teach the how is a great way to be seen as a subject matter expert. Um, I'm going to come to this thing in a second, but I did want to show you one quick example. I've got a couple of minutes. So I want to make sure I do this. So when I talk about being seen uh, as, a, as an expert and, and rising up or being seen as the 
preferred IT vendor. I wanted to use this example here of um, network engineering, right? It's a high level uh, type thing. There's not a ton of companies out there that do that. I just did a search in DSBS and I said, hey, show me the companies that have network engineering in there. And it came up with you know 489 companies. And so I can go through here and I can look. The thing is for a lot of federal buyers, they'll keep trying to narrow their search results before they actually look at the results. So that was one thing, right? Network engineering. I said, well, let me get more specific. And here, what I did is I came in and I said, well, show me passive optical networks, right? And this is a unique thing within the government, but it's kind of going forward. Now it's reduced it to eight companies. Imagine if the buyers try to um, talk to folks out there, right? And I just want to point out, like, here's this um, company here, number six, Maurice. And the reason I'm pointing them out, because you'll see them on the next one, you can go even tighter. And here I said, show me an 8A company that is doing network engineering and passive optical uh, networking. And, you know, here's this person's company comes up again. This is what I want for you when I say kind of niche down, niche down, niche down. Okay, so I'm going to come back to that page there in a second. Let me give you a couple of quick um, from today's training on how you can increase your visibility in particular as a subject matter. So um, the, I say this all the time, right? I never want to get tired of saying this. Update your DSBS, your dynamic small business search profile. This is your small business profile. And I am telling you, I now pretty much get stories every week from people who have done what I said and done what we teach or people we have helped just maximize their profile who they are getting contacted by federal buyers, right? You reach out. I was talking with somebody literally yesterday. And today is November 3rd. So November 2nd, I was talking with somebody who literally was telling me about how they just got invited in to participate on a market research. We want you to answer our questions. It was a pretty fast turnaround. And I said, well, how'd you hear about it? And they said, I think it's GSA schedule. Sometimes we get outreaches. Hold on. And they looked and they said, we found you through your DSBS profile. And I was like, Thank you, because they had actually taken the time to really look at their profile and, and treat it um, as if it's a search tool that the government is trying to find vendors like them on. And so when you update your profile, you're going to be able to communicate that this is what we say we're experts on. And if you have experience, you'll put that at the bottom of the DSBS profile. So that reinforces the fact that you're being paid for what you just said you're an expert on. And if you do it in the right way, you understand the top keywords you're trying to be found on and you weave it into a narrative um, like you just saw in some of those capability um, or some of those DSBS profiles I showed you a second ago. When you do that, you will increase your visibility with federal buyers. They will start um, knocking on your doors, but it's not just knocking on your doors, right? There's people that you schedule a meeting with before they meet with you, they'll go to DSBS and they'll see more and go, this company is squared away, lock solid on their core competency. The things they say are related to the core competency and the experience that they mentioned they have, whether it's federal, prime or sub, state, and local, commercial, doesn't matter. Their experience aligns to that subject matter expertise area. Uh, second tip for you is your capability statement. A lot of us create it, right? And I'm not here to tell you how to create the, the best one at the moment, but if you have a capability statement, make sure it's easy for people to find. On your website, Smack dab on every single page, there should be something that says download our capability statement. No email address, nothing. Just click download the PDF and it's done. Go into DSBS again. In there, uh, recently, the SBA or GSA has put in a field and it's a hyperlink to your um, capability statement. Two things about it. Most of us are missing a capability statement link. That's bad. So put it in. Second, for many of us, especially 8A companies, the SBA just took the, the one that you gave them whenever you registered to be an 8A or applied. And so it's an old 8A. I was talking with somebody who has like, oh, that owner's gone. It's I own the company now. So make sure you go to DSBS and have your current capability statement in there. And then there's other places you can put it. And I'll talk about that in a second. This is a pro tip for you. And it's really important you understand it. Use metadata. Metadata is um, data that describes a file. Basically, if you open up uh, your PDF, if you open up your Word document and you go up to the file menu, the file menu says info or property. And in there, you're basically talking about the file name, the title. You wanna go in and put some keywords, et cetera, because when you do that, that rises your profile and your capability statement and all your documents up to the highest levels. Use metadata, go to Google and search, how do I become an absolute expert on metadata? Cecilia, maybe we create a blog called How Do I Become an Expert on Metadata? Um, and then the last one is add your company to supplier portals, right? And this one is huge because DSBS is one of them, 
By the way, go um, go join our newsletter if you haven't. We just celebrated 10,000 subscribers. It's a huge deal because this are these are all in the GovCon space. Um, we're really excited about that. But if you come into our newsletter and come down, we got a lot, a lot of good stuff that I don't have to actually show you. But right here is one of our posts, uh, our newsletter articles, and it's the supplier portals. And so in here, you can find a lot of them. And here's um, inside the federal government. They have agencies have their own supplier portals like HHS has their own. And most of the billion dollar firms have theirs as well. So get in the supplier portal. If you want to increase your visibility as, as a SME, the first thing that has to happen in order for you to be seen as a trusted advisor, the first thing that has to happen in order for you to be seen as a subject matter expert is the other person has to be able to find you, right? So make it easy for them to find you. Remove the friction by being wherever they look. Whenever they look, go, hey, here I am. Hey, here I am. And your marketing uh, assets inside the supplier portal will do that for you. Okay, so here's what I want you to remember uh, going forward, going into the weekend or going into the next stage, you're doing the training. The government doesn't buy from the best. They buy from the best who show up. They buy from the best of those they can find. So if you're the best over here, but you're invisible, then the government's not going to buy from you. They're not going to buy from you until you show up, right? And the second thing I want you to remember is that being a trusted advisor, a subject matter expert, that's a verb. Think of trusted advisor or SME as a verb. I heard this from Stephen Covey where he said love is a verb. Uh, you know, you, you got to actually do work in order for there to be love in a relationship. Well, it's the same thing here. You've got to do work to be seen as a trusted advisor. You get to do work to be seen as a SME. Last one is what I already said, right? Don't forget just this one thing. Go upload your current capability statement to DSBS. Just get it in there so that the buyers, um, if they're looking for you, they can find it and continue their market research. Um, if you're looking to accelerate your success in the federal market, you're interested in working with us, check out www.govconchamber.com. I'd love to uh, talk to you about how you can work with us, how my team and I can help you go to the next level. If you get value out of this training, please become a sustaining member. And for all of us, as we go into our, our work day here for the rest of Friday or whenever you watch this video, remember government contracting is not a secret, it's just a process. I'll see you in the next training.